it is a great time to be a fan of action movies. Where once we had to settle for shaky cams, poor lighting and of course... Now we can pretty much pick any action movie or TV show at random and be treated to. But at the same time, the standard for quality has been raised for quite a while now. We have four entries in the John Wick saga, I don't even know how many of those long take fight sequences, and I can't help but feel it's all blending together a little bit. Sometimes literally so, as the later entries in this new wave of action cinema already seem to be circling back to the early ones. There's an easy way to demonstrate this by just taking a bunch of action clips and editing them together as if they are all from the same sequence. Besides being a fun exercise, it's quite telling just how seamless you can weave a lot of these together, with only marginal differences in the ways that they were shot. It clearly reveals the sort of convergent aesthetic, the distinct look that seems to have emerged from a new cinematic language. A new set of principles and goals that more and more action scenes seem to strive towards. And that now, for better or worse, is shaping the way we perceive and talk about the meaning of good action. So what is it that modern action scenes have been doing? What have they been striving towards? The key word here, I think, is legibility. And more specifically, the movement towards greater visual clarity. If you're a fan of action, you already know what this means. Instead of close-ups and quick cuts, we now tend to see wider angles and longer shots. Instead of hiding the stunt work, it is now celebrated and put to the foreground as the main reason why we go see these movies in the first place. In other words, it seems Hollywood has finally come to understand what Chinese filmmakers had already figured out decades ago. We want to see what's going on. We want to see the effort, the danger, the artistry. That is good action, right? That's what we mean when we tell our friends they should watch the Raid movies, or Extraction, or John Wick. That's why we keep raving about that hallway sequence from Old Boy. That's the one scene from Kingsman we still talk about. But the thing is, while I still enjoy these movies as much as the next guy, and will probably continue to do so when new ones come out. Man, that Monkey Man trailer looks absolutely insane. I do have some hesitations about this development towards a more singular aesthetic. Mostly with the way we seem to have created this almost objective ideal of what good action is. And probably more importantly, with the way this ideal has become somewhat divorced from the general language of storytelling. To explain what I mean, consider those many, many action scenes that are presented as one unbroken take. You can often tell pretty quickly when you're about to see one, as a movie that up until that point may have been shot in one way will suddenly look like this. You know, that cameraman look where you really feel the physical presence of the camera moving around the characters. Often a wider angle shot handheld and over the shoulder, which allows for quick pans but which also repositions slowly. The long take has become quite ubiquitous in action movies and beyond because, well, it is really cool. It is perhaps the ultimate way of showing that none of the action was cheated, even though nowadays most of these long takes are digitally stitched together and therefore aren't truly continuous. Which as a side note has come to distract me to no end as I can't help but look for all the hidden cuts, you know, like that one, or here. Nevertheless, a good one -er never fails to get a positive reaction from audiences. But it's interesting to stop for a minute and think about the meaning and implications of its usage. For the long take is not just a mechanical feature, it's also a narrative tool that can serve to deepen the experience of a story. It can create a more gritty experience by putting us in the middle of a conflict, making us part of the struggle that the characters are going through as if we are right there with them. Or it can emphasize a more otherworldly feeling by turning us into more of a detached spectator creating that sensation of floating through some sort of dream. 
Point is, the usage of the long take can be an integral part of the story, but in many of these action scenes it doesn't really feel like this is the case. They feel more like momentary deviations, like they were created separately from the rest of the movie. And to be clear, this is not to say that a movie has to be 100% consistent in its presentation or that it cannot have any sequences that take a different approach from the rest of the story to emphasize certain impactful or important moments. I'm just using the long take here as an example of this wider development in which the form and content of action sequences seems less informed by narrative considerations, and more so by these broader principles of what is deemed to be good action, as if the two have come to exist independently from each other. As for why, well, there's a few things we have to talk about. The first being that on some productions nowadays, action scenes felt like they were created separately from the story because they literally were. Have you ever seen one of these digital pre-visualizations for big budget action sequences? They are these low quality computer generated mockups of what a scene is going to look like. It's basically the evolved version of what directors like Robert Rodriguez and Garrett Evans have done in the past, which is to film cheap versions of their action scenes during pre-production so they would have a better idea of what it's going to look like when they do it for real. Which, in turn, I guess, is the evolved version of drawing storyboards. Anyways, the idea here is that you give yourself a low stakes opportunity to play around with different angles, different edits, different stunts, and so on. So that you can get a sense of what works and what doesn't. And so when the actual day of shooting then comes around, you're prepared as best as possible. Virtually every action movie has some form of pre-visualization, and that's not the issue here. The issue is that, especially with the bigger studio productions, these pre-visualized action scenes aren't made by the directors themselves, but by companies specialized in digital pre-visualization. And they can sometimes already be in place before the script is finished or before the movie even has a director. When Lucretia Martel, for example, was in talks to direct Marvel's Black Widow, she was told that she wouldn't have to worry about the action scenes and that this studio would take care of them after which she promptly walked away from the entire project. But even if she had stayed on, it wasn't just that the pre-visualization was already locked in place. From what I found, this is actually a pretty rare occurrence outside major studio productions. But more so that, and this brings us to the second and, as far as I can tell, the more common issue, that even with a template to follow, she still wouldn't be the one directing the action. For you see, much of the action we see today isn't shot by the actual director of the movie. It is shot by these guys. Hi, I'm Chad Stahelski. I'm David Leach. And that's not true. It's not just them. But they are good examples of a behind-the-scenes phenomenon that I think has contributed to action scenes feeling increasingly similar and divorced from the stories they take place in. And that's second unit directing. So, Chet Stahelski and David Leach are generally known as the stuntmen turned directors who created the original John Wick. Stahelski then went on to do the sequels while Leach moved on to other projects such as Atomic Blonde, Bullet Train and the upcoming The Fall Guy. But before that, aside from doing stunt work, they also worked as second unit directors on, among other things, some Jason Statham movies, The Wolverine, Hitman Agent 47, The Hunger Games, Captain America Civil War, and Birds of Prey. Now, a second unit director directs parts of a movie that the main director isn't interested in or capable of doing. On bigger productions, especially nowadays, that often means action scenes. The benefit of this is that studios can hire directors who aren't necessarily experienced with grand scale action, but who are very good at all the other stuff. And so combining those with second unit directors who are specialized in action can definitely result in a win-win. But if you look more closely at who's getting all these second unit directing jobs, you will start to see some interesting connections. For Atomic Blonde, for example, David Leach worked with Sam Hargrave, another veteran stunt guy who also did second unit directing on Suicide Squad, The Accountant, Deadpool 2, Avengers Infinity War, and Avengers Endgame. 
He's also the guy who went on to make the Extraction movies. And on Captain America Civil War, Legion Stahelski also worked with Spiro Rosatos, also a veteran stunt guy, also a second unit director. He did the action for movies such as Captain America The Winter Soldier, The Fast and the Furious movies, Venom and The Grey Man. Actually, Captain America Civil War had a fourth second unit director, Darren Prescott. He worked with Stahelski on the John Wick movies, and directed action scenes for Baby Driver, the Black Panther movies, Deadpool 2, and Black Widow. I could go on as this list goes much further, but you can probably already see what I'm getting at here. That's a lot of action movies that are influenced by a relatively small amount of creative voices. However, I do want to add some nuance here, because the issue is not as simple as same guy directs all the action, and that's why it all feels the same. Second unit directors generally follow the main director, and therefore have to be like chameleons who are constantly adapting to their desired vision. Not unlike the way a cinematographer can come up with a completely different presentation depending on what a director asks of them. For example, I still can't quite believe that Hoyte van Hoytema, the gritty, grand-scale IMAX cinematographer of Nolan's most recent movies, also created that warm, comfort-blanket look for Spike Jonze's Her. But sometimes a cinematographer's style can carry over from one director to another. Think of Emmanuel Lubezki, for example, whose presence is clearly recognizable in the work of Terence Malick and Alejandro Iñárritu. And when this happens, it's usually because a director specifically desired that style and wanted to utilize it for themselves. And I think that's what might have been happening with stunt work too. It's not that these handful of guys are just imposing their own view of what good action is. It's simply that they are really good at doing their kind of action. And it just so happens to be that that is what a lot of the industry and the audiences seem to desire right now. And so, the reason why the action in Casino Royale, for example, feels so reminiscent of that in the Jason Bourne movies is not so much because they both had the same second unit director for the action, that being Alexander Witt, but probably more so because the creative team behind James Bond wanted to create a more gritty version of the character and therefore sought out someone who was known for being really good at gritty action. By the way, Alexander Witt also went on to work on Fast Five, Skyfall, Spectre, Avengers Infinity War, No Time to Die, and Fast X. These guys really have impressive resumes. But again, all that is perfectly fine, I'm definitely not blaming these individuals for being really good at their job and being in high demand because of it. As I've mentioned earlier, I enjoy these action movies as much as everyone else does and deeply respect the skill and effort that goes into creating these sequences. But the whole thing does give us some insight in how we got to this more singular perspective of what good action is. And it does make me wonder what we are missing out on by not having more diversity here. My favorite fight scene of last year wasn't actually from John Wick 4 or Extraction 2. It wasn't from an action movie at all. It was this one, from David Finch's The Killer. Fight only the battle you're paid to fight. Which I find quite surprising because on the surface, it looks like it's breaking all the rules of good action. With the shaky cam, quick cutting and dim lighting obscuring much of what we generally claim we want from a scene like this. And yet, clearly, it goes hard. I mean, Jesus Christ. It made me realize, for one, that we might have been misinterpreting the exact properties that define good action. That even though the wide angles and the steady cam and the long takes are all really nice, it's not the visual clarity that necessarily makes for good action. No, for me at least, it's just as much, if not more so, that sense of viscerality for lack of a better term. It's not that we can see what's going on, it's that we can feel it. And this takes more than just getting all the action clearly into frame. Just pay attention to how important sound is in this scene, both the sound effects, as well as the music. It's a beautifully vicious symphony that takes a more sensory approach to action. Are you not entertained? 
We can see something similar in Ridley Scott's Gladiator, who also isn't particularly concerned with showing off the action, but rather with eliciting a specific response in the audience. He does this, in part, by cutting to these close-up inserts of wounds that are being inflicted. They are these blink and you miss it shots, but combined with the sound design, they are enough to make you flinch. And I think this is also the real reason we speak so highly of movies like The Raid and John Wick. It's because they used visual clarity not so much as an end in itself, but rather as a means, as just their way of delivering those sheer gut punch moments. And I guess that's the real point here, that there is more than one way to achieve these moments. That when it comes to creating good action, there's no one method or filmmaking philosophy that should be treated as sacred. The second realization I had watching that brutal fight scene in The Killer is simply that, at the end of the day, good action is whatever best serves the story. Because even though I've just been arguing how good action is actually about viscerality, it is also very much true that that's just what it needed to be in that particular movie. The killer is about a guy who thinks he is on top of his game, while in actuality he's making one mistake after another. And what better way to show this visually than by letting him engage in his first actual fight and having him being absolutely mauled like DiCaprio in The Revenant. With Gladiator 2, Ridley Scott's gritty, visceral action had a clear narrative purpose as it served to emphasize the tension between the spectacle of violence and the reality of combat. But when it comes to other movies, action may take on completely different stylistic forms, invoke completely different sensations and feelings, in order to serve completely different narrative purposes. And perhaps the most important thing about this is that if action and story are more in sync, if they operate in unity with one another, it creates this sort of positive feedback loop that doesn't just make the overall story better, but that also specifically elevates the action itself. Or, to put it like this, good action is made greater by the storytelling that surrounds it. I think one reason why the first Taken movie was such a surprise hit wasn't just because it had cool action scenes, but because of how the story created such anticipation towards them. Take this scene for example, probably my favorite one. To recap the story in one sentence, Taken is about a father, played by Liam Neeson, who has to find his kidnapped daughter. He has one clue, two words spoken at the end of that now iconic phone call. Which eventually brings him here, to this criminal hideout of sorts. But instead of just barging in and rushing to the action, the movie takes its time as Neeson pretends to be a crooked cop trying to extort the criminals. He drinks their coffee, hurls a few insults, you know, the stuff you'd expect an overly confident crooked cop to do. Your arrogance offends me, and for that the rate just went up 10%. At the same time, however, if you pay close attention, you'll also notice he's trying to get each one of them to say something, trying to find the same voice that spoke those two words to him earlier. How do you say sugar in your language? Sugar. Sugar. One by one, he crosses them off, until he reaches the last one. A friend gave this to me. It's Albanian. You mind translating it? At this point, you know he just has to take the bait and... Good luck. Good luck. Good luck. Oh yeah, there we go. You don't remember me. I told you I would find you. Man, that's... That's how you earn an action scene. Enlisting great stuntmen, coming up with cool set pieces, choreographies, and with the best ways to film them. They can all result in action that is impressive. Damn impressive, even. But without story, it's just mechanics. Good action is legibility, clarity, viscerality, but it's also setting up heroes and villains, setting those high stakes that draw us in, that make us care. It's establishing rivalries, promises, that sense of impending doom. It's everything that creates the tension before the confrontation, that turns the entire experience into a rubber band that stretches and stretches, that gets you on the edge of your seat and builds that nail-biting anticipation to its absolute peak until it finally... 
If you're a fan of my channel, you know I always value approaching a subject from different perspectives. For I believe it's the act of casting different lenses that can best reveal new angles of consideration, unexpected insights, and hidden biases that may have been limiting the scope of your perception. When judging, for example, if 2023 was a good year for cinema, you might get different answers based on what sources you review, as news outlets across the political spectrum all highlight their own cinematic and cultural signifiers to support their arguments. And it's for that reason that I've been using Ground News, the sponsor of today's video. Ground News is a website and app designed to pull back the curtain on media bias. Every story on Ground News comes with a quick visual breakdown of the political bias, factuality, and ownership of the sources reporting, all backed by ratings from three independent news monitoring organizations. For example, look at this story on the best movies of 2023. Right away you can see that 177 news outlets have reported on the story. And of these 177 news outlets, 33% lean left and only 13% lean right. You can also see who owns these reporting outlets. In this case, 55% are owned by media conglomerates. Ground News also allows you to easily compare headlines to see how this bias can affect framing. Another feature that I really like is the blind spot feed, which highlights stories that are disproportionately covered by one side of the political spectrum and which in doing so, helps you to recognize ideological bubbles, both those that exist outside of you, as well as those that you might find yourself in. Ground News operates based on the principle that our information is never completely free from bias, and that we ourselves never fully interpret information free from bias. As such, I believe it genuinely addresses one of the key challenges in our information age, that it's no longer about getting access to data, you know, the idea that if you just find the right news outlet, you will get the right news. No, it's about learning how to engage with it, learning how to navigate the overwhelming abundance of information that's hurled at us virtually every second of every day. If you want to try it out, you can go to ground.news slash like stories of old, or follow the link in the description to get 30% off the Ground News Vantage Plan. That's ground.news slash like stories of old to become part of this independent news platform working to make the media landscape more transparent.